head coach of the UCLA Bruins, Chip Kelly, on the program. And looking good there. Hair looks good, coach. It's called a shower. Oh, okay. Uh, I went beard and let it all grow for about four or five weeks. And then I decided I got to get back into a routine, get up, take a shower every day. Don't wear the baseball hat, shave a little bit. And <laughs> hopefully that will push us to getting back to some type of normalcy. What do you know now about this upcoming season? This is what I know. I know that the people who say don't know and the people who know don't say. <laughs> so I think, you know, we had a meeting with our chancellor yesterday and all the head coaches here, and um, he's extremely hopeful. Um, but his quote, and I thought it was a great thing, is the North Star that will guide all of us is the health and safety of the students. And that has to be first and foremost. And um, it was funny when this first went down, and we were, we had a staff meeting again at UCLA and we were just in the stages of, we're not going to have any fans at the spring sports. Um, they had not, it was the week they were getting ready. They canceled the NCAA basketball tournament, but it hadn't happened yet. I think it was that Wednesday. Things hadn't fallen yet. And our volleyball coach, John Spra brought up a great point. He said, how many people here would get on a cruise ship right now? Yeah. And no one raised their hand. And he said, isn't a dorm just a cruise ship that doesn't float? And then we all kind of said that was the reality of what was going to hit, you know, and that was eight weeks ago. And I think we've had eight weeks to, to work on testing. We've had eight weeks to kind of go through this. Um, all 50 states are in some version of reopening right now. But what happens over the next eight weeks, I think, is really what's critical, um, especially to our sport. And, and really, we need to be back probably eight weeks from now. We need to be back by july 20th or so if we're going to open the season on time and so there's still plenty of time in there um it's just you, you got to defer to the experts in this we, we we're uh we're about first downs and stopping people and have nothing to really understand what's going on in this and as lee corso told me um i talked to coach a couple of weeks ago is you know the game of football is not worth one person's life so we, we better make sure we got this right before we get back how much of a voice do your players have in this I think they have a voice. You know, we talk to our guys. Um, we're in meetings. We get eight hours a week with them. And most of it, not all of it, spent on just X's and O's. Um, I meet with our squad leaders. I was just texting with a bunch of them about what our meeting, our next meeting is going to be like and some of the questions that, um, you know, we need to discuss and then we'll present to the team. But um, I think they're a big voice because they're the ones that have to play and they're the ones that this environment has to be safe. You know, it's the same thing. With the, when you listen to the professional sports, um, when you talk to the players, is they're the ones playing the game. And, and I think we really need to listen to them. I'm looking at your travel schedule, Coach. What is your 2020 football schedule? I've got you traveling a total, if this happens, about almost 10,000 miles mm -hmm. round trip. By comparison, sure. Penn State would travel 4,400 miles. That's a big mm -hmm. disparity there. It is. And, and again, it's the geographics of the West Coast. Yeah. You know, there's not as many states as there are on the East Coast. Um, there's not that tight cor corridor um, like you guys are in. Um, but our league goes from Washington to Arizona, you know, and everything in between. And, and we also have a game at Hawaii. So you got to throw that in there. And that's a huge part of that. So um, in normal years, and by that, I mean any other year besides this year, you didn't really think about the travel. But now you really have to think about the travel and, and is there effects of that and how does that work and what's it like when you're on a plane and how do you social distance on a plane? And um, there's so many layers to this. This isn't a, a black or white, an up or down or a yes or no decision. It's kind of, it's like an onion. It has to be peeled and it's layered. And I think you have to really let the, the people that know it the best and that's the scientists involved kind of make a decision on kind of where we are with it. But there's a lot of things that go into it there. And you know, like, like you said. I want to talk some football with you and where do you think offense is? in five years? What does offense look like? Uh, I, I think there's a give and take between the NFL and the college game. Um, things go up and things go down. Um, but I just think there's more passing that's happening at both levels. You know, you look at the success LSU had with, you know, with Joe Burrow and um, in the offense that, that Brady brought in from the, the Saints and you know, people, it's a copycat league. And, and this mm -hmm. sport's always been a copycat league, you know, and I, I've heard this statement and I really believe it. If if you weren't in the room with Amos Alonzo Stagg and the group that invented this game, then you stole your ideas from somebody. So there's not an original idea in football right now. Um, people were running five wides 
shotgun. Dutch Myers did it in 1950, you know, and then the game comes full circle and the game of tempo, um, you know, Sam Weish did it unbelievable in the NFL, the Buffalo Bills and the K gun in the nineties, you know, then it took off in college game. Um, but I think it's, it's a little bit more wide open. I think because of the athletes in the width and length of the field, you have to use it all. And how do you use that is by spreading people out and, and throwing the football. Um, but something will come cyclical and there'll be a team that shows up that's just pounding the rock and running it down your throat. And then everybody will say, that's it. But I, I think just what LSU did last year will lead, I think a little bit more teams to kind of open up their passing game. Well, that's why when I saw the Titans and their philosophy was that we're going to run and run and then Ryan Tannehill will sprinkle in some passes and we'll play good defense. I don't, yeah. right. I don't know if, if, if we get, it's counterintuitive to what is being successful now, but I don't know if the running back comes back in vogue. It's tough because I think a lot of it is what's available. There's a, it's like economy, it's supply and demand and a ton of guys are playing wide out and not a lot of guys want to play running back anymore. Um, I don't think, you know, if you want to find a unicorn in the world, look for a, look for a fullback in this country. You know, they don't have, you know, no one's playing with them and where are they? So if you want to run that type of offense, you know, what do you do and, and what are you looking for? Um, and then I think uh, there's something to be said about being the contrarian now is, is lining up in a couple tight ends and pounding the football on people because people aren't used to that. You know, when I left college football in 2012 to go to the NFL, um, we were the only team that was spread out and had shiny helmets. And when I came back and two years ago, everybody in college football does. And so, um, but it's an up and down thing, Dan. I, I mean, you look at what Stanford does. You look at us. We're a multiple tight end team just because we inherited a bunch when I got here. Um, and it has been successful for us. Um, but, you know, when I talked, our tight end was drafted in the third round this year. He's the second tight end off the board, Devin Asiasi by the Patriots. And when Coach Belichick and Bill called me about him, he said there aren't a lot of tight ends out there, you know, and I think a lot of guys that think they're tight, that are tight ends are playing wide receivers. So it's, it's, it's interesting. And I think it's fun to watch the ebbs and flows of the game and which, where it goes, but we still are just trying to, you know, get, get a first down and try to get some points. Well, it's like the big man in basketball, the big yeah. man, when we were watching basketball was a true big man. Now he's a seven footer shooting jumpers. Uh, I went to, when I was in San Francisco, I watched one of the Warriors um, playoff games and I saw Kevin Durant in person for the first time. <laughs> I was, are you going to be kidding me? And he was just drilling threes left and right. And when you go back to the days of, you know, in the old days, some coach would have told him, get your tail down in the paint, you know, and, but the game has changed. You know, I, I think the cool part with there's not a lot of television on when you watch the last dance and see how, where those shots were taken, you know, and what a great, elbow jumper Jordan had no one takes an elbow jumper now because the analytics will tell you to back up four more feet and yeah. that's that's worth one more point you know so that that game has changed and I think because of the rules um and our game's the same but I, I think it will there's there's an ebb and flow to it we're talking to Chip Kelly UCLA head football coach could you see a coach have the same kind of personality as Michael Jordan and that be successful in today's uh game I think if he wins, um, <laughs> it's, it's funny. If, if you don't talk a lot and you lose, you're aloof. And if you don't talk a lot and you win, you're stoic. So it really just depends. Um, you know, he's a, he's a hard, intense guy and everybody loves playing for him. Why? Because you're winning, you know, and it's um, that, that usually cures whatever personality that the, the coaching staff or the, the coach himself has. How badly did Johnny Manziel break your heart? Um, I don't know if it broke our heart. You know, we loved him. The unique thing about that recruiting experience was that we had Johnny and Marcus Mariota in the same camp. Um, and we were the first to offer Marcus, and we were the first to offer Johnny as a quarterback. Um, and they were both committed, but he was – I'll give him credit. He was always honest. He wanted something closer to home. He wanted something – and when he got it and he got the opportunity um, from Coach Sherman at the time at A&M, he took it. But um, our fallback plan was pretty good. Yeah. But how you great know, was Manziel he went on in high win school? the Heisman also. So I, I, I think uh, I thought he was phenomenal. I remember and we were asked the question last year at Pac-12 Media Day, who's the best high school football player you saw? And, and that's a loaded question. But the one thing that flashed in my mind is there was a play 
when we were watching his highlight tape where he took off and went 90 yards for a touchdown um, and they were called back for an illegal formation and the ball backed up five yards. They ran the same exact play and he went 95 for a touchdown. And it was almost like, a, oh, okay, we'll do this. Team. But he was much what he did at A&M. If you ever go, maybe go to YouTube and I don't know if they're there. Um, you watch some of his high school highlights and, and they were phenomenal. Yeah, but you, you know, that improvisational skill doesn't work in the NFL. Right? Yeah, that's what everybody said until that guy in Baltimore showed up <laughs> or Mahomes showed up in Kansas City. Um, but people have been doing it. Go back to the cyclical part of what we talked about in the ebb and flow of the game. And, and I've always have wondered when you look at some of the greats that played in the past is how good would Roger Staubach be? I bring it up all the time, coach. Offenses. I do. do. Yes. I, I, I. Him and the other one that I always look at and I never saw him play to see the highlights. Would have been Sammy Baugh, who led the NFL in passing, punting, and interceptions in one season. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you get some of those multi multi athletic guys that can do a ton of things, and and they would flourish. But Roger Staubach's the one that I think, I mean, him or Fran Tarkington back in the day, and yeah. what he did, you know, that was what his his whole game was. And you're talking about two Hall of Famers that that would have been. Um, there's certain guys, and and you know Dan, that are generational players that that could play in any type of system. Yeah, and, I just, and most of the time, us as coaches will screw them up, you know? Well, I I just remember seeing Roger Staubach at Navy, and and then he goes to the Cowboys, and keep in mind, he had his military commitment. So he comes yeah. in, and what was he, 29 when he got to the NFL? Mm -hmm. and, and I just found him to be, that was that dual threat where he was really going to, he could beat you with his arm and beat you with his legs. And he was just a great, great athlete. He was, and I, I you know, I, I was growing up during that era and loved guys like that. There was a guy, Bobby Douglas, at the Chicago Bears that was that running type quarterback. You know, here, when I grew up in New England, you know, you had Steve Grogan. Uh, I think he's the last quarterback to ever wear a horse collar. You know, I remember those <laughs> days he had the big old back roll yes, on the top. Yes. It, was, um, it was interesting. It was interesting. But as I said earlier, you know, I've had guys tell us when we invented the spread, which we didn't invent, we all learned it from other people that people were running shotgun five wides in the fifties and winging it all over the places, the Bobby lanes and the Dutch Myers of the world. So um, this game just keeps evolving. Um, but it, it's so fun to watch those guys play because it's the unscripted plays um, that, that I think are the ones that we, we always go back to when we remember, you know, in the back of our minds. And you're friends with Bill Belichick. Uh, could you, could you teach what Brady does? No, well, I think you can teach a system to him, but the, the most amazing thing about Tom Brady to me is just his discipline as a human being. You know, he works out at our place in, in when he's in Los Angeles. Um, and our place is open to NFL guys anytime after 11. And I think all the guys know that. So they'll come over and use our facility. Every time Tom wants to work out at our place, I'll get a text message from the night before. Chip, this is Tom Brady. I, I, I'm like, I have your number in my phone. Um, is it okay if I come over and work out? And he's there at 7 a.m. and he's working out with Tom House, his quarterback guy. And it's, I remember just looking at him, it was, you know, last year it was the middle of April and he's working on his front foot plant. And there's a guy who's won six Super Bowl championships and he's looking at his foot plant and his relationship to his elbow and his hip as it comes through. And getting feedback from Tom House and then kind of trying to get in his mind what exactly that felt like. And you talk about someone that's a, that, that much of a stickler and that disciplined as a human being um, to be working on the little things. And I think those are the things that people don't see, you know, on Sundays, they just the work ethic and the time that he puts in. And so can you replicate that discipline? I, I don't know. That's there's very few people in the world that have that type of discipline. It's great to catch up with you, coach. Love talking football with you. Uh, wish you the best here during these uh, trying times, and uh, thanks for joining us. All right, Dan, hopefully when we are talking, it's about current football. We don't have to get back to the 50s. <laughs> the 40s. We, could, we could actually talk about being on the field, but I, I appreciate you guys taking time, and you guys stay safe. That's uh, Chip Kelly, head UCLA football coach there.